We have a sister here, Edith uh, Neumeyer. Did I say your name right? Neumeyer. 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 Depends on where you're from. Depends on where you're from. When you're in Germany, it's Neumeyer. It's Neumeyer. When you're in America, it's, it's Neumeyer. Neumeyer. Uh -huh. And we found out that uh, where we were uh, at, uh, she was only like five hours from us. So I have read her book about a year ago. I have discovered this book called The Mystery of Adam. And let me show you guys. This is the book. I'll actually show it on the screen so you don't have to do it that and, way. And um, there was like extraordinary book, very simple, written in a simple language to reach simple people with the basic truth. And when I found out that uh, this sister here is coming to Germany and we are only five hours from her at the time, uh, I was so excited. I packed up my kids and a husband and said, we are going to meet this sister one on one so uh, we can introduce her to the world, to our listeners and especially our sisters that are listening uh, because we have some exciting news and the news is that God loves women, that He values them just the same as men, that we are really powerful in Jesus Christ Amen. and also that He's calling on us he is calling to turn back to Him, so therefore we can be free, we can be truly free. So here we are, sister, you wrote the book, The Mystery of Adam, and you have based the whole book on one scripture, Genesis 5-2. That's what I'm reading here. He created, created the male and female and named them Adam. Can you explain this? Is what, what, why did you choose this scripture? Because um, my belief that the, uh, well, my discovery that uh, the male and female is equal comes from that scripture. Because I discovered that in the beginning God made the human being male and female. That's right. I'm German <coughs> background and so in the German, it's more obvious than in the English translation. You know, in the English translation, they translated human being or Adam in the Hebraic language right. as man. That's right. And so when you read man, you always jump almost conclusively to this is a male. Mm -hmm. This is not a human being. Right. Okay. But in the German language, we retain a mensch as the word, like anthropos, which is the Greek word. Yeah, anthropos meaning humankind. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what it should have been translation. I mean, yes, you can translate it man, but we are so um, kind of brainwashed or conditioned to believe that this first human being was a man. Right. That we always have that in our mind. Yes. But I came to the conclusion after doing research that it's not the case. Can you explain us, sister? Um, well, first let me ask you this. Why did you even write this book? Well, there was a time, it was about 15 years ago, I grew up Catholic. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the States and um, I was not a born-again believer, as you call it, you know, born-again believer, that Christianese word. Yeah. And so when I came to the States in 76, um, I was invited to a Bible study. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally learned about Jesus and kind of the basic things, who he is, and that I have to accept him, that he died for me. And I accepted him. I mean, because even in the Catholic Church, you learn about Jesus. And finally, I'm realizing, wow, who is this Jesus? And I want to belong to him. And um, so I accepted him, and I was baptized in the church there. However, um, I was actually conditioned to believe in those German evangelical churches that I extended, I mean, uh, attended after, mm -hmm. that, that I have had to be submissive to my husband. Right. And that was so unusual. It was so, such an unusual thing, mm -hmm. you know, for me to believe. Right. Because my parents, we grew up in the Catholic Church, but they were always partners. Right. So they didn't practice it in the house? No. The way it was preached in, in the church? A, in, in the ch churches in America. 
Right. It seems like America really still had that tradition that the man has to be, um, you know, the, the head of the house or had to be submissive. <clears throat> and unfortunately, I married also a man mm -hmm. that grew up in such a traditional home, Baptist home. Right. Where wow. the man, I mean, the man was everything. The woman didn't have any rights. Wow. She didn't, she couldn't put, put on any pants. She couldn't cut her hair. She had to wear skirts. I had no idea you were married to a man like that. Yes. Sister. No idea. Okay. Okay. And so there are Baptists. Oh yes, Especially you could back dance in the 70s. or That's Pentecostals right. as well, right? Yes, Isn't but there? back yes. then, especially in the primitive Baptists, they were very much like that. Yeah. Uh, and some of the older Baptists, and they still, you still have in some yeah. Baptist groups, you still have, still practice that the women wear dresses only. Uh, they do cut their hair now, but but, oh, that's but, good. but a lot of them still wear <laughs> long hair. Even. Yes, no makeup, no nothing. Wow. That's right. So it was very. He he grew up very very strict, mm -hmm. and of course, I mean I don't even know why he got married to me. I mean, like, you know, from a Catholic background. Right. But <laughs> anyway, so I always had that. I mean, I went to church because I really believed in Jesus. Right. You know, I wanted to learn more about it. But that was like a thorn in my flesh. Yes. You know, it, it just always thinking that can't be because Jesus loves me. Right. I knew. I mean, I always was connected. You know, to God. He always took care of me, and and I just couldn't believe that. So there was something wrong with the idea. There was something absolutely wrong. That you must uh, obey your husband. You know, and that wasn't it. But when you are obedient to somebody, completely obedient, that means the other person has really a lot of power over you. And right. he can do quite a lot. Of damage. Like for instance, a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, how about if that person is not even a Christian? Right. And he tells you to exactly. do something that is not a Christian thing. Right. And how about if he is a Christian or claims to be? And he's abusive. But he's a, a false Christian. Or oh, a false Christian. I mean, I went through similar thing as sister because um, I was in a watchdog organization yeah. where they taught me that men have preference over women and that we find God through men. So basically, there is this triangle, right? He is God, he is a man, and he is a woman on the bottom. And God communicates to a man, right. and then a man communicates to a woman. So basically, a woman has to turn to a man to find what God wants to tell her. So what if the man is not right under the under right. Christ? Right. And I, I believe. How about if he's over here someplace? Exactly. And How we have no access. And we have no direct access to God because we really need a man. We just need that man to tell us how it is. And he's a fallen creature as well. Exactly. He's imperfect. So how in the world is that? That doesn't work. So it's kind of a mess. Exactly. And that's what I always saw. That's what you saw. I saw a lot of danger. Yes. You know, I feel with women that are being abused and used. And how many centuries have we been used yes. and abused? <clears throat> that's that's right. true. I mean, all through history. Yes. Have we been abused and used? And silenced. And silenced, yes. That's right. Absolutely. So let's get back to your book now. And so we know why you wrote the book. And I agree with you. Yeah. And you say, I hear Genesis 5 2, that the first creation of humankind was not a male. Would you please explain deeper? Who was Adam? Who, who was a created being? Yeah, that first word in the Hebraic language is Adam. Right. Okay. And so that became our word, Adam. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and our name, Adam. But that wasn't true. The first human being that God created was a man and a woman together. Because he said in the beginning, um, you know, I will create man, which was Adam. Right. Right. In my image, yes. and I will create them male and female. That's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's not the only proof. But then, when we go to chapter two, what do we read? 
He took what out of that first human being? A rib? That does not. That doesn't go. Is that the right? That's not true, right? Here no. we have a. Here we a, have a skull, right? Yeah. So here we go. The, the, well, the, the it's God debated. A it's debated amongst even the rabbinical scholars as well. Uh, but I also come from the, the the side of the the Chabad Jews that do not believe that it actually represents a rib. Um, in fact, in uh, the 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 Orthodox uh, uh, Chabad organization, which I'm still a member of. Uh, we believe that it represents the side, but the thing is, and, and let me just clear, clarify this though, and this is from Orthodox Judaism, the way they look at it, they believe that God literally took the entire side yes. of that man down and formed the woman, mm -hmm. okay, but it's deeper than that, Okay. it's deeper than that, that was only for that, see, because notice what Adam says afterwards, and he gets his name from the mankind part, but he's not called Adam either. He's actually called Ish. Right. He's not called, and she's called Isha. <laughs> yes. Like he said, Adam comes from the word Adama, Adama yes. being the ground, yes. and he called him Adom because mm -hmm. for the mankind. Because why? They were made from the dust of the earth. Yes. We're still made from the dust of the earth exactly. to this day, because every time we take in food into our body, we are taking in the dust of the earth. Mm -hmm. So we're still that that part of uh, of reality. And Adam says that she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That, he says that because that DNA part was made up from that half of his side being removed and making her. But ironically, God literally says that he takes from, as he says in Hebrew, minish, from the ish, which is what he was called, which is the compound word in Hebrew, which is fire and God's divine name. But she's also made up of the exact same thing, the divine name of God and the word fire. In other words, it was the spirit of almighty God that was dwelling inside of them. And they both had that, but he takes from that and makes Isha. And that's where we have two of them filled with the Holy Spirit at that time, as we would right. call it today, filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. So this was the point when God took Eve from Adam. Mm -hmm. That's the point when he became actually a male. Exactly. A man. Because in the beginning, the first human being had both. Yes. Right. See, the DNA of the male and the female was in the first human being. So therefore, the first human being could have not been a male. Right. Because it was a yeah. mix. Yes, it was a man and a woman okay. together. And also talk about that first, that word of the rib. It right. was what? Sela? At home. It's all of the yeah. alone. Sela, right? Yeah, Salah, Salah is actually Salah. the word for the fourth side. Uh -huh. uh, so it says Mit Salah, Salah Ta'av, ta which is uh, from his side. Right. Not the rib, the rib is completely different. Right? Yeah. yeah. So. And that word Salah is also used one time as in the two sides of the door, that kind of. Uh -huh. You know, the two leaving doors that come right. open like that? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And that's the same word that is being used for that. So that one side of the door. Right, so basically, we cannot even imagine right now how he looked. Oh, or or that man. It's that kind of hard to say, you know. Right. But we also know that he took the side of that first Adam. Of first human kind. Okay, human. that human first, or Adam. Okay, he took that first, that side, he closed the side, and the, the man was formed. Yes. And then he formed, with the rest, he formed. Eve. Eve. Exactly. Or not Eve, but the female, Ish. Isha. Isha. So, Isha. Isha. And Ish was right there when he closed the side. Yes. And for some reason, he had to add some other touches to the female. Yes. Well. Because he formed on her something. Yes. yes. Whereas well, by the male part that was left over, when he took the female he closed ingredients, up, you know, he closes he it. Mm -hmm. yes. And then he forms female yes. or ish. In his wisdom. Right. He exactly knew how we have to be. Now taught. later on in chapter 2, he says, Therefore a man shall leave father and mother mm -hmm. and cleave to his wife. And the word cleave is basically the Hebrew word for glue. <laughs> yes. Glued to her. Just but like they were. Probably. That therefore refers to what? 
the dividing. Therefore, a man, because he divided them at the beginning. Oh, okay. It's like a uh, action and then re reaction exactly. cause. Yes. Right. Okay. It's a cause of. Yeah. Because. He because separated. he separated them. Then the now man he needs to cleave, cleave to together. And isn't that also a Hebrew belief that a man alone is not a full right. human being? That is that is taught in Orthodox Judaism exactly. that uh, that until you are married, married. you are not complete. Uh, a man is never a full being yes. until he is actually married. That is actually, again, another Chabad uh, teaching. <laughs> Basically, man alone does not represent God. It has to be the a image female. of God. The image of God. It's only male and female because yes. together. Because when they're together, right. then, then mm -hmm. you're considered one. Then you're considered one and on his image. As, as the Bible says that he created. Adam, humankind, male and female, he created them on his image. Right. So man alone, separated from a woman, is not really representing not fully the yes. image of God. And again, as an, another thing is when you look at that the man was created in the image of God, male and female, that also means that God has male and female components or characteristics. Yes. yes. Yeah, well, we can see it throughout scripture. Absolutely. I mean, he refers to himself many times in a female language as a mother exactly. who cares for the children, right? So he's not only our father, he's our mother, he's our everything, he's, exactly. he's both, he's our parent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Now, this is the next step. Okay, go ahead, sis. I want you on. to speak, because your book Because is... the next <clears throat> thing you need to go to is... Okay, we understand that, but now we also have to understand that only through male and female can humankind really experience God. Right. Females experience God through their femaleness. That's right. Men through their maleness. The story of Mary and Martha. Oh, you yes. Know, when Jesus clearly says that she uh, chose the right thing. Was, yeah, it was the greater thing. The better thing. thing. The better well, thing. actually, he called it the better part. A better part. <laughs> yes. He said she chose a better part. Yes. And he actually added, it shall not be taken away from her. Exactly. That means he spoke for himself as God. And he said, I will not take this away from her. Yeah. So who is the man to take it away from her? If woman has a call on her life to represent Christ, if she's given revelation and wisdom of Jesus Christ and he has chosen her, who is a man to take, take it away, that kind of call from, from this woman? But you know, Jan, it's important that we encourage women because so many times the men are not the way, the one taking it away. From oh yes, her. let me ask you this, sister. You told me when we were having our conversation before yes. we were on the camera that when you wrote this extraordinary book, I mean, I please get this book, sisters, and read it. Um, <clears throat> you told me you had enemies, and I assumed, well, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, Christian brothers who disagreed with you, but was it only men that disagreed with you? No, absolutely not. It was a lot of women. Okay. I come from a town, and I probably shouldn't mention what town it is, <laughs> but it is a, it's an American city in which I think probably most churches are um, having or holding the traditional view on women. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think? Why is it that uh, women themselves become enemies of women who understand their call? spiritual call? You know, there's many reasons. I mean, one of the reasons is maybe they're just blind mm -hmm. um, and they have been passive for so long right. that they cannot speak out. I think a lot of women are so passive that they feel actually comfortable because you, you can't be comfortable and safe if your husband takes care every, of everything. Right. What you're dealing with is spirits to begin with. You're, right. you're, you're, we're in a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual battle. Absolutely. And if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a godly spirit upon you. But you have to remember there's also evil spirits. Right. And they're very active. And the evil spirits are not prejudiced of whether or not you're male or female. 
if, if, if you're willing to yield yourself to that spirit, that spirit will take hold of you. Yeah. And if you've already been, as a woman, in bondage, for whether it be your whole life, part of your life, whatever the case may be, you're controlled by the spirit that you're uh, of whatever system you're a part of. Yeah. Uh, in other words, if you're a Baptist sister, you know, unless you've already been fighting inside of you, and yes. you know that something is not right scripturally with this, uh, but yet you're looking at this Bible, especially if it's a King James one. I mean, I got Hebrew Bibles, but if you got a King James Bible, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and, and a lot of good about the Bible, period. But the problem is, though, is you have to remember the people that translate it are not inspired of God. Right. They were under an agenda. And therefore, most people, and even ministers, especially the old-time ministers that, that, that America has had, that didn't have any training in biblical language, uh, or, or they weren't trained, or if they were, they were trained by a, a seminary that's already got an agenda as well to make sure the women stay suppressed. So therefore, the women are suppressed under the same spirit. And when you try to approach that, they really believe they're defending the Word of God. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. And, and it's helpful if they do understand it, because to them, you're taking, like this says, you know, a woman shall be sa saved in childbearing. And we know that literally, from the Greek, it doesn't say saved, S-A-V-E-D, yes. but mm -hmm. saved, S-A-F-E, yes. yes. you know, but they've not done that study. So to, to them, you're attacking God. Yes. Yeah, sure. You are attacking God, and so therefore you have become an enemy. You're a threat, and that spirit that's upon them, whether they mean as well or not, it's, it's there, and, and you're dealing with that. Yes, and you want to please God. Yes. You know, as a woman, you you know, you want to do what's right. Right. And so it's, it's, I know it's very difficult, but you are so right. That spirit that is attached is so important. I yes. totally agree with that. That there is only one man between mankind. Yes. Not male, but between humankind, as we talk, between Adam and God. And that's Jesus Christ. So if we put somebody else, even our own husband, yeah. between us and, and God, that's, that's idolatry. Yes, you can actually say that. And right. you're right. I think women will be, well, they're already held accountable. Right. And I think a lot of women do not realize that. They hide behind um, their husbands. Right. Oh, he's going to take responsibility for this. And they are told that. Okay, they are told that the man will take responsibility, but it's not true. But so if the husband makes a mistake, and the wife knows it, and she doesn't do anything, she is still accountable. She's for that. accountable for it exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a legal thing too, right? Right. And 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 one other point that you got to think about, all right, if we're looking at the idea that. Men are the spiritual leaders, men are the head of the home, etc. And he's responsible for the spiritual well-being right. of the family. How do you know which spiritual well-being of which organization, which group is the one that's correct to begin with? You know, if you've got, and, and I don't even know how many different denominational views there are, or how many doctrinal differences there are out there, and the cults, clans, everything else, uh, starting with the Vatican all the way down, even into Buddhist, and then you get into all other kinds of ideas that are not even related to Christianity, you're really putting, a, it's a serious situation, maybe I should say that way, you, you really got a tough situation yeah. you're dealing with now, because um, if he's your head, and he's just taking you off into a cult ride, uh, or you grew up in a cult ride, and you know, Every, the whole point comes down to this. Every individual is, stands before God alone exactly. as a mono. You stand before him as a mono. You have to make for yourself that decision. And that's man or woman. Makes no difference. The only ones that are under any subjection are your children until they are of age. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones that are given that particular type of authority. But, but when it comes to man and woman... There is no such thing. Headship, there's no such thing as a headship in the Bible. About headship uh, mm -hmm. in, in your book, yeah. you're talking about how 
The Bible describes a man as a head of his wife. How do you understand the term head? Well, it, uh, if we go back to the Creek, and you probably more the Creek scholar than I am, um, then, you know, it, it doesn't uh, say that this head is more like a source. Exactly. You know, and it goes back to the original uh, Genesis. Beginning. You know, the beginning. The beginning. And, you and, know, and, and, uh, um, or source yes. in terms of, he could be the provider. Right. In that terms as well, like when Paul was writing it, women, they were pretty much taken care of by the husbands, okay? yes, because they were kind of more in the house, and, and so the husband was the source yes. of the woman. She depended on her husband for, you know, things. Yes. Um, now, from a cultural point of view, uh, at that time, in, in a society of Apostle Paul, uh, men did uh, care for their wives uh, physically and, you know, in a social life, she completely depended on him. Mm -hmm. However, I really believe that when uh, Apostle Paul is speaking of a uh, husband being as head in the Greek kefale mm -hmm. of uh, his wife, he actually is not even talking about cultural view. He's speaking of the beginning, very, right. very beginning of Genesis, mm -hmm. where the man, uh, when she came from a woman, right. meaning that she originates with man, she came from him, from, uh, she is him basically. Mm -hmm. She's the human kind. The source of her is a man, right. just like the source of Christ is God, and that's true. Because it, it speaks that how head of Christ is exactly. uh, God. Yes. Now, as Christians, we understand who Jesus is, right? Right. Okay. And the head you know, of him was God. Exactly. The source, source the exactly. origin of Christ <laughs> origin. is basically mm -hmm. his father, is God. Yes. And the same, in the same way, the origin is uh, of, of the source of a woman is a man. Therefore, it talks about oneness. Yes. It talks about the same. See, now we're talking about, again, about really something um, that I'm hesitating. Because what did we say? The source of the woman is who? The Adam. Adam. Exactly. Exactly. Which is not really man. Anthropos. Anthropos. Right. It is, it is mankind. Mankind, exactly, that original human being. So my question, and I haven't done enough research in that, but I would like to find out, and maybe Stephen you can get into that, what did Paul believe in those days? Because I know we know that a lot of um, rabbis believed very strongly in that. I know Philo knew that the first human being was different. Mm -hmm. than what was created afterwards. So my thing is, what did Paul believe? Because I did a little research and he says, you know like where it says the man or the woman is from the man? And I looked at that word and it was anthropos. Right, but you know it's still, it's still, uh, Paul is still speaking even truth in that. Yes, because, what because was, it's anthropos. Yes, what he was being. explaining to us yes. is that man and a woman are one. They're yes. the same kind, they're the same thing. That's why exactly. they are in submission to one another. Uh -huh. Because if you know in Ephesians when it does speak of this head headship, yes. I don't like that word, it's a man-made word. Yes, headship, it is. It the is. headship doctrine. There is no such a word as no. headship inside the Bible. Falsely translated. So basically what Paul starts with in, in, uh, in Ephesians 5, 21, mm -hmm. it says, be subjected to one another, to one another mm -hmm. in the Lord. Yes. And then he says, wives to your husbands. Husband. It doesn't say again, subjected. In Ephesians 5, 22, the word uh, subjected is not there, not, there. not no. the original exactly. uh, manuscripts. That, that's mm -hmm. always added by translators and it should be in italics. If it's not, it should yes. be. It's not in there. Uh, he Basically, it goes very nice flow. Subject yourselves to one another, mm -hmm. wives nice to job. a husband, because the husband is head of the wife, 
source of the life, okay? Yes. Because they are one. And he actually, entire chapter ends with that mystery. He yes. says, let me tell you the mystery. mystery. And what's the mystery? The mystery is that um, the husband shall leave his mother and father. He says it. It's mystery that husband shall leave his father and his mother, and he will be glued to his wife. Because the mister is basically the, they belong together. the oneness, mm -hmm. the oneness and love. The okay. importance, they cannot reflect God fully unless they are both reflecting it. Yes. And if the woman is stuck in the closet. Yeah. And yep. then in your book, you also mentioned witch craze or, you know, hunting after witches. Yes. Right? So tell us about that a little bit. Well, it's not too much to tell. It's a very sad chapter of history. Um, of history. And I mean, it's just part of really plotting out any, well, it started out with plotting out any non, any believers that were still left over. And I think the women, they just fared very badly during that time. Unfortunately, they we were really, a lot of them were killed. Yes. And what I think was even worse than, yeah, it happened in Europe, yes. is what did these, you know, we always brag about the Christian people and how we, in, in the United States, we found, were founded on Christian beliefs. What did we do? We brought the witch hunt right over to our country. Yes. What happened right. in Salem? That's exactly right. And I'm thinking, now how did this happen? That's exactly right. As Christians, we were founded on Christian belief and we bring this stuff right over to our country and continue it. Right. I mean, it didn't continue very long, but it happened one and... and well, we are in, in a land right now together, Germany, where I yes. guess that was the really heights it of it. It was terrible. Heights of it. Some villages uh, stood without women completely. Uh, some were very few women left. It was a total craze. I mean, witch craze. It was awful. And they were killing off these women. And a lot of historians would say, well, men died too. And that's true, but yes, when I they was, did. they did. But when I was doing research uh, recently in this, I found the men that was accused of witchcraft were mainly men who were either husbands of already uh, of witches who were accused, and the men who would stand up for them, right? Who, who tried to stand See, up. See, the Inquisition was not necessarily about witchcraft. It was a lot about um, anybody who was against the Catholic Church. That's true. Yeah. Was killed. Everybody. Right. Um, it started with, um, in Spain, you mm -hmm. know, with yes. the Inquisition. Jews were first part of the Inquisition. That's right. So anybody, and then they just use it against anybody they wanted. Okay, so <laughs> when you have, exactly, when you have Genesis 3.16, you talk about Genesis 3.16, um, uh, what do, do you see Genesis 3.16 as churches are teaching? Uh, they have a reference to it as a law. They're saying that a uh, rule of man of a woman yeah. is a divine decree. Well, it was prophesied by God. God saw in the future what will happen when they fell. In other words, uh, they decided not to listen to God anymore. And so after the fall, they both became sinners. They both became extremely self-centered, yes. and as a result of that self-centeredness, well, the men will be ruling over the woman. It's yes. very uh, an obvious thing. But do you know all, what also happened after the fall? I mean, right after the fall, what did Adam or the male being do? What did he do? Blamed the woman. He blamed the woman. Yes. But he also named, renamed Eve. Right, gave her a different name. Yes. He gave her a different name. What did he do? He kept the name Adam for himself. That's a very nice observation. It is. That, that is, that is interesting. What does, that, what does that mean? He kept humanity for himself. He stole wow. humanity from the woman. 
That is so true. Are you writing about this in your new book? It's in there too. It's in this book. Well, I read this book here ago, and since then I read so many. So that and maybe one... I should have really stressed that more. Because, yes. but that's what happened. It's not only that he's going to rule over her, but he stole humanity, and that's all throughout human history. That and you know that's happened. true because that's exactly what they teach in church. He renamed, and when you re when you name somebody, that means what you give. You have authority over that person. Right. So, see, in traditionally they say, well, Adam, the male, he named all the animals. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't Adam, it wasn't the man. They both named the animals. That's right. That's so right. they had both authority over the animals. But now after the fall... That, that is in the plural as well, by the way. When he talks exactly. about that, because in Hebrew, Hebrew is not like English. If you say, right. uh, you know... You can say you in English, yes. and it can you don't know if it's singular, plural, or whatever, except through a context, and it can easily be taken out of context. But in right. Hebrew, you cannot. And so they were given dominion yes. over all the animals. Exactly. Uh, That's because both, both named them. Yes. Right. Well, Adam named them, so you're saying it was the Adam, humankind. The humankind, the human anthropos. being, anthropos. Named that the named them. But then the male took over right away. And he renamed the woman and kept the name Adam. For and himself. pushed her to a corner. Yes. So basically, humanity has been stolen from women. Yes. After the fall. Yes. Right. And that's what we live with in our world. And I, exactly. It's still, it's still, it's still what she the enmity or hatred between the woman and the serpent. See, yes. so Satan would always be uh, on the attack against her. And he has no other uh, course but to use uh, someone to do it with. I mean, that's obvious. It's just like... Well, yeah, because she is helpless. Mm -hmm. She is not empowered anymore. You know, the man took over and... You know, I, I'm, uh, this, this is sinking in right now because... Uh, it's really true that Adam, as a male stole the humanity it, yeah. from a woman. So we are not even looked at as a human being. No wonder they were being. talking the way they did about us. Right. Because we were not fully human from the beginning. But now, do you think sometimes that it is our own fault? Well, listen to 3.16. What does it say? Okay. It says, he shall rule, but your desire shall be your husband, for your husband. And now let's talk about this word desire. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 16, he says, uh, El, uh, Elisha Amar, Haba Haobeng. Okay, and he says to the woman, this is God speaking. Now, most translators, even in Orthodox Judaism, are going to translate Haba Haobeng as I will greatly increase because we're looking at two words here, Raba. Uh, being repeated, and generally speaking in Hebrew, when a word is repeated, uh, like in English where you have the L-Y, that's what we would do in Hebrew. So the word Rabah means great in one respect, and then if you repeat it, Rabah, Rabah, you would say greatly. All right, and so just great because we've repeated the word twice. But there's a problem with this. It doesn't just say Rabah, Rabah, it says Harabah, al -rabeh. So we're using the definite article he in the, in the first place here, which is the, yeah. but then you use an arabe, the aleph, which actually gives it a future tense meaning also. So it's kind of out of sequence. So if it's going to be the word great, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because the way the sequences it are. But if you also look at, at, at the, uh, in, like in the second word here, arabe, if we don't look at this as being the word great, the 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 uh, the resh bet he, if we look at it arabe, uh, because of the way the vowel sequence is here, then we actually have a different word altogether. And that word then, now the word becomes ambush. It's the exact same word that's used in Joshua chapter 8. It's used eight times in Joshua chapter 8. And so what we really have here is not that he's going to greatly multiply something, her sorrow, but what is going to happen is the one that ambushed her, the one that attacked her, which was the serpent, and caused her all this problem, he is the one, he is the one that is going to greatly cause her 
first off, uh, she would have suffering, yes. Uh, it's, it's a vonecha, okay? But then we come with the next word, verchanecha. It's not the right word for childbearing. Conception. Or conception. Uh, a child for tele, tele, uh, teled is for uh, childbearing, but for the, for the word for, uh, for conception, uh, you actually, if you look at Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, the way you actually spell the word conception in Hebrew would be he, resh, vav, excuse me, yod, vav, nun. There's two letters that are missing in the particular case here in Genesis. It's spelled here, vav, for the word and, and then you, but the word uh, conception they have on here, he, resh, nun. It would not be unusual to have a vav maybe after that, cheresh, vav nun, and then we could say, okay, it means conception, but it doesn't. It has a yot and a vav. So it can't be two vowel letters. So therefore, it's not conception. Tell us, mm -hmm. is, is it Ruth 4.13? It's the Ruth chapter 4. Conception is properly. It's That's the way it's properly, for the word conception, Ruth chapter 4, verse 13 is the way the word conception would be. In this case here, he's saying that, uh, he's saying, I, if, if I were to translate it the correct way, and he said to the woman, the one that will ambush you shall cause you suffering. The one that had ambushed you. Yeah, the yeah. one that had ambushed her would cause, great, would cause her great suffering, suffering. and sighing, uh -huh. would be sighing, because that word is actually sighing, will cause you to sigh, and, uh, and, and you would be in grief, okay? So you'd be in grief and in sighing, um, not it's not a physical pain. The the, the right. next word there, be, be it's not, it's it's uh, taladai. In in other words, what God is trying to to show the people when they're reading this is that she's been attacked by the serpent. Yeah. And it's going to have a future implication. That's why the aleph is is written there <coughs> to begin with. Al and that implication would be the result of children. But it's going to be the fact that the children, one child, is going to kill the other. Ah, yeah. This is the sorrow and the pain <coughs> that she's going to suffer. So it's not necessarily physical pain of childbirth, as a lot of churches teach that. That's why women are in so much... Just the pain of having kids. Uh, After women. people, yes. And, and if you think about it as a woman, and I'm sure your sisters will agree with me, the childbirth itself... Yeah. It's no big deal. I mean, really, is it? I mean, do we really say that when we are in it, oh, that I'm so punished by God? No. The problem for us is actually afterwards, these yes. children, when they get sick, when they read, or yeah. when they don't want Jesus Christ. Yes, absolutely. When, when no, they are yeah. putting themselves into dangerous situations. Yes. This is our suffering. <laughs> this is our well, problem. It's, it's, it's prophetic to begin with. The whole verse is verse prophetic. Because he says to die by name. You're going to birth sons, literally, by name, yes. his sons. And then the next one, when it says, your desire shall be for your husband, Please explain is sure. also prophetic. It's not a law or a commandment, exactly. but it is prophetic. This is what's going to happen because you listen to the servant. Exactly. Yeah, because he says here, uh, after he says, uh, you, you will birth sons, he, then he says, Ve'el isha tushutecha. And this is what's really sad here because it, it tells us that she had a direct relationship with God himself. Because to shutecha, from the word shuk or shuv, is, shuv is to turn around. She is mm -hmm. now turned mm -hmm. from God. She has lost that spirit of God that yes. was in her, just as he did. They both lose it. And she now turns to him. Now, could it be that, and this is only speculation on my point part here in saying this, but I have wondered, does this actually come? Uh, because when he says, she says, you, you shall turn to him. And then he says to her, uh, He's going to rule over you. He's going to master over you. He'll be your yeah. Lord over you. Yeah. And I've wondered, could that have actually ha did it happen right then and there? Which probably yeah. so, in the way you oh, mentioned yes. earlier about uh, the fact that he renames her. Mm -hmm. uh, he renames her immediately thereafter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's true. 
Uh, because Chava is actually how we say Eve in Hebrew. Chava, uh, they call it the mother of living, or uh, it's, 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 it's using the word life. It's the, it's the bringer of life. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, this is going to be your job. Stay home, make kids. Mm -hmm. so, he, so she was domesticated, like a domesticated animal. That is an interesting term. Yes. Exactly. Wow. wow. Can you think about that? I mean, she was domesticated yes. like an animal. <laughs> she, was, she was just made to be home and keep it up and, and, and have babies. Well, and, yeah. he did, if, the, the, even bringing up the fact, like, like you said, being domesticated like an animal, in reality that's what it becomes because now he's, who did, he, who did they have dominion over? Over all the, the, the beasts of the field, even the fishes of the sea. Yeah. Now he's usurping a dominion over her. He has actually demoralized yes. her and brought her estate to a beast. So he is acting outside of original plan of God. Yes, absolutely. So basically we can come to a conclusion that if today any Christian man wants to rule over his wife, he's not under God. He's not under God. Nine. No. He's not in his original plan. He is absolutely He's not wrong. acting mm -mm. based on redemption no. we have in Christ. See, that's exactly what Christ brought. Tell, tell us about this. You talked about this in this book as well. Yes. So, tell us what Jesus accomplished for women. Well, he brought them back again as human beings. Thank you. You know, amen, amen. Um, he paid for them in the same way. Yes. I mean, the way he treated women, it was to so wonderful. He was revolutionary. Yes, revolutionary. revolutionary. Absolutely yes. revolutionary. His own male disciples were just speechless. Yeah. Think about the woman at the well. Yes. I mean the Samaritan woman. Yeah. How wonderful he was. You know, and, and, and the disciple, how can you talk to this woman? They wondered, right? The Bible actually says how they wondered among themselves. Yes. Oh, he's talking to a Samaritan and a woman. Uh -huh. and, by and you know what he did? Send them away. <laughs> Go away, get some food. <laughs> That's exactly what the women are supposed to be doing, right? Right, exactly. Good point. But he told them exactly what they expect women to do. He told Go away, get some food. Yes. Take care and, of that stuff. And, what he, and let us talk. That's exactly right. Isn't that interesting? And what is yes. he telling the woman at the well? He's actually revealing to her something new that he never mm -hmm. revealed yet to his male disciples, and he's the Messiah. Very spiritual, huh? Yes. Yes. He says, I am he. And he says it to her, knowing she's going to go and tell the whole village. Because that, isn't that how we are, sis? When we are really excited about Christ, what do we do? We we're women. excited. Yeah, we're, we're just we're excited. Going. And mm -hmm. we will not be quiet. Yes. Yeah, and I guess she was one of the first missionaries, huh? She was out of there. She was the first one that went and said who he is, who she saw. And uh, she caused a many, the Bible says that many in her village. Yeah, I think in all Samaria. Because of her testimony. Yeah, I think in all Samaria, in all Samaria she caused a racket. So if Jesus Christ had redeemed us back to humanity, yes. he gave us back the place we lost, yes. why are today's churches insisting on teaching Talmud? And I, I want to still, I know it's a long show, but I want to still talk about how they teach Talmud because yes, you are teaching Talmud in today's churches. Uh